of this is the transfers via the crop procurement program and the government is unlikely to be able to repeat this uh, in, in the coming year. Procurement programs, that's where we stand with vis-a-vis -vis growth. Of course, remittances are also playing a large part in the aggregate demand and in the purchases that we see, but primarily that's also a rural sector uh, phenomenon. So the rural economy is doing very well, but the urban economy we know is quite uh, under uh, stress. Secondly, uh, this growth rate that we, that we see in the economy they has come in the face of two very large constraints. Okay? And these constraints are, of course, as, as no surprises to all of us, one, the war on terror. And according to our calculations, if these calculations are correct, uh, the war on terror is costing Pakistan's economy roughly two to three percentage points of GDP every year. Okay. So this is not just the direct cost, but these are the collateral damages, the indirect costs via, you know, not just lost exports, for example, lost exports comes to mind. What's happened is a very, there's a very pernicious effect of this war, in, uh, or war on terror, which Pakistan has been fighting on behalf of the global, of the global uh, community. And that's, uh, that is not appreciated uh, generally, both at home and abroad. What's happened is that Pakistan has not only lost exports, but Pakistan has also lost the ability to move up the value chain. You know, we were get getting, as we were getting more and more ready to get plugged into the global production chain, this war on terror and the effects of it has, have unplugged us from the global production chain and have consigned us to the really the lowest, uh, you know, as, a, as basically a low value added commodity producer. Just when many segments of our industry were actually invested and ready to move to the next level. So this is not uh, a transient cost. This is a permanent cost. And then there's a permanent cost in terms of when we, div when we cut the PSDP every year and divert it to security spending, th there's a net welfare loss to the economy via the multiplier, via the other uh, welfare uh, you know, costs associated. And therefore, those are permanent costs as well. We cannot... We cannot recoup those costs in subsequent periods. So Pakistan is facing a huge uh, impact. Uh, the economy is facing a huge impact because of the war on terror. The, the second impact, obviously, is as, as I started, uh, Shabar Saab, uh, you would be glad to note that as soon as I started, there was an energy breakdown, uh, an electricity breakdown. So uh, the energy cost we worked out is roughly about two percentage points of GDP a year. So we're operating under huge pressures and no other country, mind you, I negotiate with the IMF uh, and part of the negotiating team uh, with the IMF. And when we get, uh, you know, certain um, comments like, you know, Pakistan has not done enough, maybe not from the IMF, we get these co comments more from, uh, you know, the World Bank and the ADB, especially the World Bank. You know, Pakistan has not done enough or it, whatever. My job is to remind them of the context in which Pakistan has done what it has done. There are at least about 22 or 26 countries like Pakistan which have moved to standby arrangements with the IMF. At least 16 of them are off track. None of them are fighting the Taliban. None of them have an energy crisis the way we have. And despite that, we have raised electricity tariffs to make the energy sector sustainable by at least 45%. For certain categories, it's close to 60%. While this hurts the economy, in the long run, this will make the energy sector viable and more conducive for new investment. So that's the commitment under these circumstances. The second uh, context, and I've spent quite a lot of time on growth, I'll just uh, you know, go through quickly about uh, the, but it's important to understand the second. The second context obviously is, uh, the second element of the macroeconomic context is inflation. While growth may tick up to about 3.5% this year, and agricultural produce will also be good, uh, not bad, but we still, s we still f uh, face the specter of high inflation. We brought, managed to bring down inflation to 8.9% year on year in October 2009. Since then, inflationary pressures have intensified very rapidly. They moved up to inflation, CPI inflation moved up to 13.7% in Feb. It's come down. Um, in Jan, it's come down to about 12.9% for March. Nonetheless, this is not an acceptable scenario and we are worried about, at least I'm worried. I think I should also start off by saying, I should have started off by saying that these are my personal views and not the views of the Ministry of Finance, right? Because I am giving you, uh, as, as 
old colleagues and as friends, I'm giving you as candid a view of the economy as I can. But these are not the Ministry of Finance's views, these are my personal views. So the inflation situation is certainly not acceptable. And I think this is something that uh, the government is really focused about um, and has to fo uh, focus about. But this is a global phenomenon. This is not just Pakistan specific and let me and too often when our uh, some of our uh, you know learned writers write in the papers they they tend to forget uh, the broader issues and let me you know try to give you some context to this globally food inflation has increased about 22 20 20.2% uh, uh, February 2010 versus February 2009 and how do we measure this we use the the uh, food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations Food Price Index, the Global Food Price Index as a proxy for global food inflation, and that increased 20.2% in February versus February uh, 2009. Pakistan's food inflation is currently around 14.9%. Uh, India's food, food inflation, despite the fact that it reports a single-digit CPI, uh, uh, WPI, Wholesale Price Index, India's food inflation shot up to 19.2% in February, uh, in January, it's come down to about 17%, but it's still uh, very high and a matter of concern for them. Let me give you just a quick rundown of some global commodities and how they moved up in the last 12 months. Sugar globally has gone up 91% in the international markets, sugar prices. In Pakistan, they have gone up 60%. Wheat has declined 11% internationally, but it's gone up about 12%, 12.3% in Pakistan. Oil has gone up 90% in the last 12 months. Okay, so that's the context for inflation as well. It's easy to see why there is an inflationary impetus in Pakistan as well, and it's important to cap it. Okay. <coughs> also, there's the source of, and partly as a result of these uh, price pressures, we've increased petroleum prices about 30% in the last 12 months. We've increased electricity prices, like I said, between 45 to 60% in the last two years. The third unfortunate element, which is a, almost a perennial now for every, every pre-budget and post-budget seminar that I've attended, and I'm sure Asrar Roof Sahib would validate this, is that this year, once again, despite our best efforts, the tax to GDP ratio is unlikely to cross 9%. Okay. There will be a tax shortfall. But let me put this in context as well. In the context of an extremely weak economy, uh, FPR will manage something close to 13-14% nominal growth in tax revenues, uh, hopefully. And that, I think, is in itself an achievement under these conditions, under conditions of flux in the administration side of uh, tax administration side, the introduction of the IRS and whatever, uh, and all the other um, uh, you know, uh, headwinds that FPR has faced. But nonetheless, the sad fact remains that we are unlikely to cross 9% or around 9% of GDP as a tax to GDP ratio. And the reason I'm talking about all this is this would feed into the budget strategy or should feed into the budget strategy. So I'm laying out the context for the, the forthcoming budget. And mind you, let me just uh, also tell you something about the budget. For the first time in Pakistan, this budget will not be a one-year budget. I mean, what you'll hear and read about is a one-year budget, but it will be framed in a, in a three-year context. It will be uh, framed in the medium-term budgetary framework context. You may have heard about this earlier as well, but I don't have time, and maybe in the question and answer session I can explain to you how fundamentally different this budget is, both in terms of how it's being framed right now. The priorities committee is meeting right now in Islamabad and over the last few days, setting the, the, the allocations for various ministries, the line ministries, not just in terms of how much increment they want over last year, but in terms of outcomes. So the principal accounting officers are sitting there right now in the Ministry of Finance saying under health, for example, or education, in the next three years, the Ministry of Health intends to have these three deliverables for, the, for Pakistan. And these three deliverables would mean, in terms of costing, this amount of money. And then the Ministry of Finance will say, okay, you know, this is what we have for you, the ceiling, and you need to manage and therefore prioritize these, uh, these three outcomes. Next year, that principal accounting officer who will sign off on this will come sta uh, stand once again, sit in front of the Ministry of Finance and say, you gave us this much money to do this, but we've not managed to achieve or we've managed to achieve this, 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 and therefore that year's, next year's allocation will be determined 
on how much they've managed to achieve or overachieve or underachieve or whatever, right? So this is a new